Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to oxum.substack.com or join the YouTube channel directly at even a dollar a month. Today's guest is Dir Nahom. Welcome to the program. Glad to be here. I like to, as you've probably seen some of the other conversations on the channel, begin by asking, especially the the deacons who, um, you know, if they're invited on here, I, I assume they have some sort of depth in the faith. What was the faith of their parents and grandparents like? Because I'm perennially, perennially interested in this idea of how much that contributes and how hard or not to push or pull in raising the next generation? Mm, well, my parents have actually, yeah, my, one of the most amazing parents, which is ironic because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, I would never have said that two years ago. Wow. Yeah, it, uh, the faith was something that uh, was definitely a war ground for like both of us, like uh, not just me, but also my siblings with my parents. And it was, it was quite a journey, but I think what my dad, uh, father Solomon, <laughs> he, what he did. Is that funny to say? Well, I just, I just like to say that. Cause like, you know, you never hear an Abisha like a priest like reference as a father. It's usually got these, so I just, you know, like to throw, throw that a little bit, but anyway. That's good. Um, he, one thing that he did amazingly, I, I would say that he still does is, um, maintain the integrity of the relationship that orthodoxy has across the border, mm -hmm. um, which really helps me realize, uh, oh, I have communications with people that are, you know, from other traditions, whether it be, well, for the most part, I, I had a lot of connections with the Coptic. Because yes. they're, they're more pr prolific, I believe. Um, but in the uh, English language, that, yes, yes, very much so. Especially like I don't see a lot of Syriac, um, Malankara, or uh, Armenian presence online. Not so much. There's was one channel, Urho the Way, something like something like mm -hmm. that. And besides that, not really that much of a presence. But um, so yeah, I just we would go um, to a lot of retreats. Uh, there's just one monastery actually. Um, I believe you guys have a St. Anthony in Cal Cali. We do. And then, uh, down here we have a St. Uh, Mary and a St. Moses the Ethiopian, actually. It's a coffin. Yeah. Uh, are, are you talking about separate monasteries or the, is it the deal that they have multiple parishes on one site? Yes, basically. They have multiple parishes on one yeah. site. So yeah. St. Anthony's has like eight. There's oh, like wow. a St. Mary of Egypt there. There's a. It's fascinating, actually. The. Um, the St. Anthony's is actually a very tiny building, which the monks use for daily usage. And that's in Newberry Springs, California, about halfway between um, Las Vegas and Los Angeles. And it's, it's close to a, a midway point that many people know called Barstow. Uh, and, but the St. Moses, the Ethiopian is actually the largest of all the parishes on the site of the monastery. And that's what most people use when they visit. Um, unless you are one of the people who they allow a lot of people to do this. And I have a few friends who've done it um, long term. But if you want to live and work at the monastery, then you would kind of use the St. Anthony's. But the kind of average tour visitor doesn't uh, only uses the St. Moses, the Ethiopian or St. Moses, the black St. Moses, the strong. You know, I heard actually about, a, oh, I don't know if it's uh, verified or not, a miracle about the St. Moses parish at St. Anthony that mm -hmm. it was actually in instituted or uh so what's the word when when an altar is, is uh consecrated consecrated uh it was consecrated because there is an apparition of saint moses and then saint moses pretty much said i like you guys need to make a parish for me here which is you know ironic it sounds a lot like you know like the ethiopian hagiographies uh just how they would kind of go about things um, so it was very interesting to hear about that in america in like you know the past 30 years i believe is, is what yeah. happened yeah but what's the main um i guess what's the titular saint of the and it's in corpus christi or where is yes. it it's in corpus uh, it's uh inland from corpus christi maybe an hour away 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's right by a lake. The it's it's co-named, so it's it's both Saint Mary and Saint Moses. But they do have uh, two other parishes: one for uh, well altars, uh, one for Saint John Cami, uh, and one for Saint uh, Anthony. Actually, and the Saint Anthony one is exclusively, like you said, for the uh, monks, which is uh, you know I think it might be a trend here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah the the non priestly father of all monks yeah um so so you said what you went there on your own initiative though or your parents would take you to the monastery yes yeah, so we, we came across uh I, I don't even know how we came across like the existence of the abbey but uh, just we went on a uh, retreat once as a family and then after that we took our whole parish actually um and um it was very uh edifying mostly because there were two converts that became uh monks there and just one of them um wow. provided me like with the information that's actually part like partly why like whenever we conversate you know off off the record uh i'm, I'm kind of in between the two schools because the the, the convert that the, this guy he's uh from the alexandrian school so he compiled like this like humongous 500 page uh document uh, in which he just cut all the quotations of, and then like organized all the quotations from the Alexandrian fathers, Athanasius um, and uh, Cyril, and then just pretty much organized the fundamentals of Christianity. Um, both Is that Saint the, the Cyril Catholic, of Alexandria you're talking about, right? Not of Jerusalem. Yeah. Yes, Alexandria, and mm-hmm. uh, he pretty much just compiled all of that, um, the sacraments, and then also uh, used uh, pieces of the um, the sayings of the Desert Fathers and the paradise of the Desert Fathers to just kind of, uh, and it, it was, it's just so beautifully made in the sense that any Christian that's just purely trying to practice Christianity, it's it's definitely like a very useful tool. Anyways, he, he provided me with that uh, and then just, you know, various conversations with him. Um, not a lot, not a lot of them intellectual, but just, I, I just got a feel of, um, an entrance into intentionality rather than uh just like just following the rituals which is like what i noticed amongst uh the ethiopian landscape so it was it was just a fresh a fresh uh breath of air yeah i i i really want to come back to this point of exploring faith as it's transferred from one generation to another but you laid out on the mat there a little bit of inside baseball that the audience isn't going to fully comprehend but in the uh, so-called Oriental Orthodox Communion, or as I often say, the Afro-Asiatic Orthodox Communion, because I like to refer to things linguistically, it just seems to make more sense. And I think it'll make more sense on this topic which you raised. There are, and, and this is a phenomenon across the historic churches, but it's, I think, amplified in our tradition, specifically by two branches of our tradition. And that is from the very beginning in regards to biblical exegesis and interpretation. There were two main schools, the school of Alexandria, Egypt, which would be centered on the Greek language and Greek thought and Greek philosophy, which at its worst wants to supplant the Hebrew uh, Bible and its patriarchs for the Greek philosophers and to say that it was a sort of um, foreshadowing of the New Testament. And then it's, you know, it's handy to get to read the Septuagint and the New Testament in the same language, you know, that that's mm-hmm. that's easier than having to learn this other whole other language and whole other series of thoughts. At its best, it's seen as um, probably the most intellectually rigorous and most respected in in terms of eloquence and, people who are interested in capital T theology. On the other end, you have the school of Antioch, which is of Syria, the first place people were called Christians, and the place where St. Paul was in the wilderness, as Galatians gives testimony to, for 14 years teaching before he consulted with any other of the apostles. And the place where you did have some people writing in Greek, like uh, the controversial Theodore of Mopuestia, whom we use in our Psalms commentary, 
and St. John Chrysostom, who I think um, most people venerate as one of the greatest preachers of all time, but some people, it sounds funny to say, don't respect quite his capital T theology. It doesn't have the theological power in other people's, in certain people's points of view, not mine, um, of the of the others who are engaged in um, argumentation and combat and uh, you know uh, ridding the world of Manafakan and getting rid of the attacking the heretics and um, but but it's really exemplified in my opinion by everything written in Syriac and many things written in Gutiz because I think that Syriac and Gutiz being Semitic languages bound the thought that was available and gave them the easiest possible leap to understanding Hebraic thought, which they were incorporated into when they received Christianity. Because, you know, you see the way Paul talks and you're included in the story, whether you're a Jew or, or Gentile. And I, I confronted Deacon Nahum one time, telling him that there's a little bit of a tension between these two to, to put it lightly, um, and, and some real like historic episodes of, of enmity. A friend of the program, Dr. Michael Wingert, who has his own um, program and, and channel where he's been spreading Aramaic and Syriac and Hebrew and all sorts of great ancient stuff that is uh, related to this. Um, he, he works with many Copts in Agura University, an institution of, of our larger communion, and um, they try to mastarak, as we say in our tradition, and say like mm -hmm. these things are more compatible and less mutually exclusive than Deacon Henoch would make them seem. Um, but yeah, what what could you say about <laughs> that initial confrontation? You don't have to agree with me, um, mm -hmm. but I did want to just push you in that category because it, it seems the Greek emphasizes this um, mystical hesychasm, mm -hmm. right? the the repetition of the jesus prayer i think mm. is 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 one thing but there's a whole lot of i think um mysticism on that side whereas on uh, the alexandrian side the greek side whereas the the semitic side the, the theriac the side i i view as just practical explanations and exhortations on how you need to live your life um you know, in, in community. But mm -hmm. what, what did you, what did you, I guess, take away from that? Cause I don't want to say like, I think I know what you mean. Like you found them to be deeply spiritual people. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I think um, um, we, we definitely discussed about this. And um, at first I wanted to reside with the school of Antioch, as you said, cause it, it uh, fixated on um, especially John Chrysostom, which, uh, of whom I'm, you know, I, I'm on the same boat with you. I'm very fond of. Um, I would have sided with the School of Antioch, but I think, uh, and I'm going to have to side with um, Dr. Michael for a look, for just a, a tad moment because um, I was reading uh, a few weeks ago. I was reading the life of Gregory the theologian, one of the Cappadocian fathers. And um, it was interesting. It, 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 the, Is it an autobiography or who wrote it? Yeah, I, I, I believe it was a biography. It was an autobiography. It was on one of the sites, you know, the, the CTEL, the uh, classics. Um, and it said the bi biographer, whoever it was, he said Gregory the theologian was first a saint and then a theologian. And I thought that was, you know, so profound in the sense that, um, you know, uh, intellectual, obviously the, the, the current theological landscape is uh, very much intellectual and uh, doesn't really consider the actualities of human life. And it's almost like it's divorced. And that, the way that I like to think about it, because, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Jonathan Pajot. Um, I like to like symbolize things in a way. Um, so I like to think of the the extremists in the Alexandrian uh, more so Pharisees in a way, the extremists in, in that arena of uh, fixating on uh, the intellectual pursuit or the 
uh, articulation of uh, theological realities, or as you said, like mystical uh, hesychasm, just trying to work out their own salvation by means of understanding higher realities, I guess to say, and fixating on, you know, just uh, expounding on those realities or just expounding on things and fixating on the expounding in and of itself and not the action in and of itself uh, changing the person uh to go like by what, what christ said you have to lose your soul to find it in the sense that you can't hold something too tightly and then expect that thing to change you if you're seeking to control it in a way and then i, I think i think of the like extremists in the school of antioch not necessarily uh, having a strong get, uh, grasp on um, the inconsistencies that arise within um, certain situations because uh, the mystical aspect of it is definitely necessary but then as we see like the rise of secularism I guess you could say uh, a lot of people would would just say okay then this father said to do this and then to do that and then just uh, ignore a sense of uh, being a little bit more scrupul like balancing scru scrupulosity with simplicity, I guess you could say in a way of of understanding. Okay, there 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 are areas I am I am not full, but then I need you know what I mean. And that's where I see the the Alexandrian filling for for the Antiochian and then kind of working together. Obviously, it's a very confusing landscape because uh, they both have their own uh the the fathers within within it definitely have their own but then the, i guess that's what where i like the the sense of the consensus of, of the fathers of just trying to um, and this is where you know theology, theology degree would be helpful to kind of see which fathers are very um beneficial in the sense of practical life but then also how to view reality like, like cosmology just because it it really helps like to, to build down into actual real life understand cosmology and then the mystical aspects of reality uh to actual life so i think there's a balance to be had if that makes sense if i have been rambled i don't know um i'm i'm trying to wonder i'm it, it's interesting because you seem like and this is my best attempt to segue it back you seem like the type of young upstart who when you were little you would have had questions and you can correct me if i'm wrong there and there's a habit of some people in our tradition of shutting those questions down but the way i hear you talking now it's almost as if you explored all of these questions and then realized you were asking too many questions and then you're like telling yourself to stop asking certain questions is that is that anywhere near the mark fix fix and i i, I think yeah i think definitely there's there's definitely um uh, yeah you pretty much hit it on the bullseye i guess you could say um because um i've noticed that um the uh, i guess the rich the 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 story of the rich young man that spoke to christ is most apt to describe me in a sense, just like uh, close to very close, but then not quite in the sense that he- uh, are you, You're talking about from the, this is a great segue to the plug for the ministry. Are you talking about the gospel of Luke and the, the rich man that has no name and the yes. poor man named Lazarus or no, Lazarus? Well, <laughs> no, no, not that one. I, oh, okay, well, tell we, me. We can use that as a segue, but then the, the rich man I was referring to is the, the one that asked, oh, I have fulfilled the commandments. And yes. Said, uh, what more can I do, Christ? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Christ said, "Okay, if you fulfill the commandments, that, that that should be fine." But then he said, "Oh, I have I have fulfilled." But then, uh, he, if you want to be perfect, let go of your possessions. And then the the, the person became almost saddened by it. And I guess in in this sense, me I have become saddened in a sense of. Uh, because I asked a lot of questions, I tried to fit the entire history of the church into and confine it within my understanding, which you know I, I realized was an Im impossible feat. 
and no one really like anyone even when you look at church history there there wasn't um uh, and we, we we tend to deify church fathers in a sense that uh, like everything that they say goes you know but then when you look at history you know everyone has their own uh, shortcomings and uh, misgivings and like falling short and if there's anything that uh, that helped me it was to notice these shortcomings and to realize that at at moments in which you think you have it figured out is when you least have it figured out so um in those moments i i tend to i tend to use um the i guess to, to oversimplify it in a way alexandria tries to explain god and how god created the universe and how how reality works and then antioch tells you okay just brush your teeth like just you know shower like we don't need you to stink you know what i mean and then and then alexander, oh, <laughs> <laughs> alexander could, could try to tell you like why you need to shower and like what what are the uh, ramifications of you not showering but but there needs to be a balance of of those two things because if you're too lost in trying to figure out why you shower you're just going to lose your mind uh, really honestly because you're not like you're you not I, I guess back to what Christ said you you can't hold on to your life too much even in, in, the, in the landscape of orthodoxy you can't hold on to your understanding of uh, reality but rather you have to like leave room for faith I guess, and then if, if I want, if I may, the point where I stopped asking questions, ironically, is um, Father Alexander Shmem, and he, uh, you know, obviously from the uh, Russian Orthodox uh, Church, you know, uh, from the Alexander tradition, I guess you could say a little bit. Um, he, in one, of, in, uh, they published his journals after he passed, and in one of his journals, he was actually critiquing a lot of theologians in, in the current um society where there is too much intellectualizing and there's too much uh fixating on the rituals on the technicalities and not giving room for faith giving room for the mystical nature of god to to act you know because you can't explain away god because it, it would be like trying to make the tower of babel because you know it, the the idea of getting to god sounds great but then you can't get to God without God in a way, you know? So it's kind of, that's where I got, I, I kind of tried to balance it out by understanding, okay, the Alexandrian tr tradition helps, but then the uh, Antiochian is, is more feasible for life. So having both those to a certain extent doesn't really uh, pan out, doesn't really uh, affect, you know, my, Spiritual life, I guess. That, that's beautiful. And Shmemen is a beast. Um, my father, Father Thomas Finley, who was in the Russian church for 30 years before he came to ours, uh, he was a big fan of Shmemen and he would give me different articles. And one of the most fascinating ones I ever read was about parish structure in Greece and in Russia versus in the United States and poppy paste all the same issues that we deal with with boards uh parish councils all these things he wrote about it man years yeah. before all the freaking scandalous videos on youtube and facebook that are still coming out of of silly beef between um parish councils and bishops the most embarrassing thing even you know a couple episodes with the patriarch mm -hmm. um and other such stuff that we're seeing and with deacons and with married priests but uh yeah i recently just purchased the liturgy of death because there's been a lot of death in in california people um dealing with mental health issues um two cases one very public one less public one eritrean young man one in northern california ethiopian young man in southern california both had taken their lives it's not my first time seeing that in our church community i've uh, come across it a few times and several of the times the pattern i notice is that uh, people come up with to me as a man of hollywood which are like hollywood scripts of alternative explanations rather than occam's razor 
which tells you not why what happened ultimately happened, but that what happened happened. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I would tell people, I heard people say things like, oh, they had money stored away and someone wanted to kill them to take their money away or, oh, it was, um, you know, it was like a crazy plot against them. And, and I understand the human desire and want to kind of let the imagination run wild. But to me, I just, um, I just see hurt and uh, pain. And I think the, this debate, this academic debate we talk about between the two biblical schools, I am obviously a partisan. I have a side. But the reason for that is because there's so much hurt and pain in the here and now that I want to emphasize how do we comfort the afflicted, grieving, mm -hmm. sorrowful families right now. Um, I don't want to have long-ranging debates about the efficacy of whether or not the prayer of absolution is appropriate in these cases or not which you know some people still bring up and i just uh, i respect the church's stance and i don't i don't entertain you know you just throw your lord have mercy up but you never want to sacramentalize sin and mm -hmm. that simple statement is across the board of in many many it's it's the decision making ethos behind many of the decisions that the church makes and you know i kind of stand behind that without like focusing on that and focusing more on like what is it that that we can uh, do for people in the here and now if you'll let me go backwards unless you have an immediate comment i do want to um, know like do, do you have an immediate comment or? yeah just a, a really yeah. quick oh, please, I, I guess please. the, that's the point that you made and and it's definitely something that we we see everywhere probably you've seen it more than i have um, cause I'm younger, but, um, just a uh, little. <laughs> and I've, I've, uh, noticed that, um, with Schmemann and, and then I, I can't uh, talk about him enough, uh, in the, in the sense of, uh, these questions that math of questions that I used to ask was pushing me in, in a very unhealthy direction. Um, and if there's anything that really, really helped in what, uh, in the way that he, uh, spoke. And then also just a shout out, uh, in addition to his uh, writing, there is this new book re uh, uh, referenced elements, uh, The Transfiguration of Elijah. It's actually a fiction book written by a, an Oriental Coptic priest. Wow. And uh, it's, it's uh, an anonymously written. It, the the author is written, referred to as a priest of the Oriental Church. So if you want to check it out. Um, the way that that book is written is it in, in essence how i would describe the coming the molding together of the alexandrian tradition and then antiochian tra tradition because like the, this author is just beyond beyond uh, intelligent and beyond like uh, the, the only thing i can refer to it as is divine love re revelation and so to kind of relate it back into mental health um it, it's for for you to uh, in, in a pastoral setting, I, I believe that to come up with practical steps uh, in which to comfort the grieving, we need an assessment slash understanding of why the grieving are grieving and where that gr grieving comes from, and then also the background of the people that are grieving, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so um, you mean and, like how much uh, church among, education they've received, or and not just that, but also just like their the the their upbringing, and then what mm -hmm. what's their like outlook of the like there are various factors, but then the point that I want I wanted to drive home is, um, there would be people that if you said okay go pray, they would they wouldn't they wouldn't you know be so apt to to, to receive that, but then if you just gave your presence just you being there you know just you uh uh consoling them in the sense of uh and and uh on a, rel a relational basis um I, they would benefit that much more and so yeah. you know what, what i'm trying to say is uh 
I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not like an expert of the school of Antioch, but that distinction can only be made through being able to uh, understand uh, a lot of nuances, but also from the perspective of certain, you know, fathers um, understanding. And I think like that, that theological slash mystical understanding definitely helps in uh, dismantling or understanding how to approach a, like a certain or a, whether it's a mental health crisis or um, any uh, any sort of crisis it, it, it definitely helps I believe so um, because I mean unless it, you know we're trying to just be um, free just do-gooders volunteers I, I, just to, to come from a church perspective or from the uh, perspective of Christianity, I guess it, it would require a, an understanding of that. I believe that, I think. Yeah, I think I, I try to be a harsh preacher and teacher whenever I am. I try to make sure there's always a critique there. But in the, um, especially of a young person, in the falling asleep of a young person, I um, I go out of my way to begin by reminding them of the fact that you just said, I, I kind of congratulate them for showing up. Wow. And I congratulate them because you you can have, like you said, tiered steps of what you can do to to walk someone through grief. And there are a lot of people who've made it their profession to do so. Um, and some of that is parallel or competitive with the church, I think, as an institution, and some of it insofar as it's um, pharmaceutical-based, you could say it's different. Um, it's It's got its own lane. But what I, I do is I tell them, like, yeah, not everyone's a preacher and teacher, but to your point, like, you can... Uh, you can go sit with people and cry. And some of that culture back home, you know, it's gotten ridiculous to the point where you have paid criers, people who are paid to come and wail on your behalf. I don't know, because you're not good enough at wailing or something. But just sitting there wailing with them. And there's even a zema or a melody to the wailing of our tradition. It's very impressive. Um, I actually like the wailing. I don't like it when the women beat their chest because I've heard some cases of people getting internal bleeding from that. Um, and the kind of starvation I saw my own grandmother when her husband, my grandfather passed, like lose 40 pounds during the Arba or the 40 days. Like you see people doing incredible feats of outward piety to remember their their loved ones. But I think... Um, while you mentioned Pharisaism earlier, there is always uh, an element and a risk of Pharisaism. I think one of the most beautiful parts of our culture is that that gathering that is done to just sit with them. Mm -hmm. Even if all you did was sit there, listen to the priest give a homily and um, I don't know, do the do the parts of the prayer response that the people are supposed to like that those little things are big and add up they have a exponential multiplier effect when all of these people are doing it too that i think does comfort the grieving family so i you know co-sign that element of it and i wouldn't assign it to any school but I, I mean it's it's a pretty practical move that anyone could do you'd be surprised uh just yesterday at an ethiopian new year's celebration i was joking with my friend who told me about another wedding he had crashed and the question i always ask people is like have you ever crashed a funeral and i even wrote a, a blog piece about it once because in the oh, wedding yeah. crashers movie yeah mm -hmm. in the wedding crashers movie they actually also crash a funeral and that's in order to get chicks but there's a way in which you can crash a funeral in order to try to comfort some grieving and sorrowful people that you don't even know. And that might be some of the heights of righteousness if we're reading the book of Ecclesiastes properly, especially chapter seven, which is something I go back to a lot during, during those times. Um, 
uh, can I go backwards? <laughs> yeah, we can go backwards. I want to go backwards. Um, here's a segue. Did your parents ever take you to any funerary services when you were young? And if not, what what are your like first memories of a funerary service in our tradition? My first uh, service was actually just three, four years ago. Wow. Uh, yeah, so I, I was never, um, yeah, I never participated, not only in a f funerary service, but if, if someone died, I would never, I wouldn't know about it until much, much later. And by much later, I mean like years down. And have you been, have you been a deacon longer than that? So is that uh, like overlap with your? It, uh, it does. Like I, the, the way that I attended the funerary services because I was a deacon actually. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was, it was very difficult to, t this is the thing with me, just, uh, practically speaking. Um, I, I do, I don't necessarily know how to react or how to kind of be, I guess, in, in a funeral. Cause like definitely the, on my heart, like how you said, I would, I would definitely be the type of person, uh, if, if we were living in the same state, we would crash w uh, funerals together. But then as soon as I crash the funeral, it's not like a wedding. I, we go do Muslim, you know, like it's, it's, we have to, there's a certain, again, like a lot of contexts and uh, then that needs to be uh, considered. And I don't know how, like how I would go about comforting, I guess you, you'd say, cause, because I was never raised around that. So now, um, you know, I, I would definitely, I, I give a, a homily for um, a funeral of a dear friend a little while back, about a year ago, actually. And it was very difficult because, um, you know, I was looking out to the people and, and then also the the grieving, the, the family. Um, it was, you know, it's just how, like, how can you speak about, you know, the glory of the resurrection or just, you know, trying to soothe them, talking about Lazarus passing away and then the, the Christ crying or whichever like sermon uh, formula that you use for a funeral service. Uh, how can we speak about that when our direct culture is to sit down and then pretty much force out the cry? Um, and then, you know, like, and then, and so on and so forth for 40 days. And then, you know, in that early stage, uh, I don't think is the, the time to, you know, try to, uh, oh, you know, feel better, like feel good, yeah. type, type of, you know, because, um, yeah, it's it's very difficult. It's very, uh, it's been very d difficult for me. And uh, I don't know if you have any uh, yeah. advice for that. I would just say keep showing up. You know, um, I know you have also an interest in uh, in fitness. My weight has fluctuated a lot of times in my life. And one of the times I was on a really good program was back in 2010. A friend of mine introduced me to uh, Beach Body and specifically the P90X by Tony Horton. And he had this thing because there's a mental battle people have where they want, especially data prone people, they want to measure everything. Everybody's got an Apple watch. Everybody's got the, the Ura ring. And these are definitely not advertisements for them or whatever, you know, Garmin, whatever um, smart tech brands that people have because they want to maximize and and there's some beauty in it you know i've been using my uh, health steps and um just the basic health app on my phone tracking my steps and mileage recently and um but tony horton had this thing that he would just say just show up just compelling yourself to get to the gym is more than half the battle because mm -hmm. what if you have flawless metrics one day but then you don't show up on the other days it doesn't matter your flawless metrics are nothing so don't even try to measure your performance or the metrics by which you helped grieving and sorrowful people. Just keep doing it. It's funny you said three, four years ago. I am a little older than you. Um, I I started doing it about 10, 11 years ago, um, way before I was in the diaconate. It was a funny, awkward thing where 
I was in the choir, not because I could sing, I can't sing, but because they said, oh, this Ethiopian American knows how to read. So if you know how to read, you know how to sing, which is a very ludicrous thought. They threw me in there. So I was in the choir. So I was one of the Mazamaran. So you could call me Zammari Henok. I was one of the choir members. And then they're like, hey, he's kind of good in the Sunday school teaching, which I was in the Sunday school. And they're like, why don't you start teaching? So I'd start and uh, the, the now administrator of our church, which is monk back then, Hiro monk, he would take me to people's houses and um, he'd be like, all right, you're teaching. And he would have me teach and he'd be like, I want you to reach everybody. So say it in Amharic and in English. And I would start there. Then they started inviting me to do it on the actual Audem or the, the circle, the procession of mercy <laughs> in front of uh, the tabernacle of the Lord. And uh, again, I'm not even a deacon. So they would get into weird places where like, we can't call him um, Ato Henok or Mr. Henok. That would be weird. We can't call him Deacon Henok because he's not a deacon. So they went with uh, Zammari Henok. Then they would say Zammari Henok Lias no? <laughs> The <laughs> choir member Henok who can't sing is about to teach. And it's kind of, uh, it reminds me of the story in Acts where the um, <clears throat> the deacons are appointed to to be waiters, to, mm -hmm. to serve food, literally. Uh, and then you see the proto-deacon and proto-martyr Stephen give one of the best sermons of all time with the richest Old Testament language of all time, uh, doing a completely different task. And I think that the <clears throat> St. Luke is telling us somewhere as we say goodbye to him as we're entering the era of St. John, if you look back on that, that episode of the ministry of the first deacon as a reminder of how our, our roles kind of change over time. But yeah, I, I'd been getting into it from there, but my, yeah, my simple advice would be just keep showing up and just keep doing it. And you actually have this added talent where you are, uh, well, you know, could uh, <clears throat> come to a dicey item. You, you are in one of those best of both worlds categories. My favorite people in the church, I watched a clip recently that one of our friends posted of Abba Gavra Maria. And he is a monk who I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was trained at uh, Taikan Agast in um, Addis Ababa, but now he's in Gwandar. And he is a professor of Akwagwam or of the non-Eucharistic liturgy, and he was singing something. But he's also known as Arataina, the four eyes, which is an insult in English, but in Amharic, it is a great compliment. It means you're um, a scholar of four different categories of scripture and patristics in our tradition. And so he he's on the preaching teaching side, as well as the singing side. And so are you. So I think in those places, obviously you don't want to step on anyone's toes, but if there is uh, some mawasa'it, you can study. You can have our Book of the Dead that you could sing for the people. Um, even as a deacon, there are things you sing, right? I don't know how you do it. At our church, we sing the psalm, O soul, enter into your rest. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, doing the deacon parts is contributing, singing, uh, in a way of soothing them in a kind of very calm, ordered manner that we do it. But also, you know, if they uh, are open to it, you can just stay ready with the word. And they might not always call upon you, but if they ever do, you, you can be ready to, to share that word, especially in English, which, you know, is going to be to your advantage more than theirs. Um, and increasingly, as we spend more and more time in diaspora, mm -hmm. that's going to be more and more needed. Very much so. I uh, I'm very I, I like when you, whenever you tell that story of uh, how you became a, a deacon because uh, it's uh, indicative of the fact that anyone from any background can be a servant, um, and the only thing that keeps them from not serving is their unwillingness, I guess. Um, and so yeah, being ready, very should just showing up very much. So you just showed up to the Mazamara became a deacon. So. <laughs> and by the way, before I was a deacon, they would and there's there's actually like footage of this from Andenat Gubai in 2015, which was just a few months before I was ordained, and I didn't know that I was going to be ordained. People literally on camera 
you think they're like joking or being funny literally assumed I was a deacon. Mm. And there was one guy who just introduced me on the stage as a deacon. The priest would do it too. They would just call me deacon. I once had an argument with a monk at an English liturgy where I read the two parts of the assistant deacon and of the main deacon, and I read the Acts of the Apostles. The only thing I didn't read was the gospel, mm. and I wasn't even ordained. And then and they called me a deacon after while I'm sitting in the audience. And I got up and I was like arguing. I was like, I'm not a deacon. He's like, who are you to tell me what you are? And I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> but but like, yeah, other people would introduce me and I'll be like, um, first thing I have to make a correction. <laughs> I'm not a deacon. Uh, and yeah, so a lot of weird situations like that before it happened. But enough about me. Um, you are a priest's kid, as you mentioned. And, you know, I was uh, plucked out of nowhere, people can say, but I do like to remind people, my father's father was a, a, a deacon of Ashwa Mikhail in Dereda, and his mother was a, <clears throat> the daughter of a priest from a long line of uh, uh, clergy from Northern Shoah. Um, so uh, probably not an accident. Sometimes it skips a generation. But were you destined to be a deacon? Do people say that to you? Like, oh, it's obvious you're a deacon because your your dad was a priest. You mentioned you had siblings. I actually don't know a ton about them. Are any of the other ones uh, boys and deacons as well? Or is there, uh, I don't know, a Sunday school teaching or singing sister? Um, so, yes, uh, my I have two sisters. And uh, they are serving the church at the capacity of just Sunday school, uh, not necessarily choir which is uh, interesting because not a lot of priests, kids that you would, you would see aren't, uh, that aren't part of the choir member, but they, they are serving at the Sunday school capacity. But for me, I, a lot of people expect it so, obviously, because, you know, the whole, the, the title of priest, and then, you know, there's that assumption. But ironically, anytime I, I tell the story of how I became a deacon, everyone just gasps and <laughs> laughs because, um, and, and no one really believes me, but this is ex exactly how it happened. No embellishment, no hyperbole. I was told the night before uh, that I was going to be ordained in Beacon. And um, I have learned, you know, um, the ideal, you know, the, the a memorization of the Udasya uh, Mariam, the Theotokia, the praises of St. Mary, and, um, you know, some of the Malik's. I don't know actually what, what's the English equivalent of Mix? Uh, There's a funny about? argument we had when Lika Diakon Tasfa Mikhail, also known as Rowan Williams, was on my program because he chose not to to translate the word in his rendition of um, the full daily prayers um, when he he wrote for Melka Mariam and Melka Jesus in English because he said it's a technical term so he wrote the word melk in english and then he defined it in a in a glossary at the end of the book which i respect because he has a glossary i take a different approach and i do say something like image or likeness and mm -hmm. then you have to explain it because when you go with mary and jesus you have it is their image their body parts which you are saluting and greeting the issue goes when you go into you know the extracurricular like melka mm -hmm. kurban and melka other things mm -hmm. that that are no longer body parts of a human mm -hmm. being yes you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh yeah. so that's why he kept to the technical term but for me those are like uh denotations and there's a connotation there's like an original meaning and then that that original meaning is extended to other contexts I see, and, like and the, the, or the pilot, the pilot of the soul in in other liturgies. It doesn't. It's not actually hadafi nafs, but because it's from Kadasi, uh, um, the nafs of the Lord. But you know, we apply that elsewhere. Okay, I see that. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and and uh, with Deacon Mahadi, uh, we like navigator of the soul. Yeah, <laughs> navigator. I'm 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 just used to. Um, I know. Father and yeah, Father and the nafs abradi yilik. Yenefs Ashagari. Yes, Ashagari, Ashagari, very much so. And so the story is, you know, simply put, um, I I was, you know, I, I learned, but 
which, uh, by the way, I think the reason of learning though the those uh, locations, I believe, is because um, at some point is was the common language in, in Ethiopia, I believe, at least for clergymen. And so, to memorize Udasi Maram is to know the theological uh, expositions of the Father. Mm -hmm. Yes, but then now it's just a uh, just a reiteration game, or just being able to say it word for word rather than knowing what it means yes. and uh you know again like back to intentionality and and uh meaning so they don't ask you to interpret it they ask you to pronounce it correctly exactly exactly which i think is personally is, is a little bit of a problem but in any case i learned that but uh never expected to actually you know enter the vocation because i i learned it back when i was in ethiopia which is over eight years ago uh and i was ordained um seven close to seven years ago as soon as i entered uh, america and so i thought that was very interesting because uh i just i did not see that coming at all and in in a day less than a day actually in a few hours i ended up being uh, entered into the vocation of deacon um so glory to god Let's see, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Uh, I'm the same way, by the way. Um, a lot of different ups and downs, but ultimately it was at the um, the Waizema or the Eve celebration of Sion for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Abba whispered in my ear, uh, during Mahalate tomorrow morning, you will receive. You will be entered oh. into the diaconate. I was like, oh, is that what's going to happen? Okay. <laughs> Wow. So so you you maybe gave off the appearance of being destined for the diaconate, but it wasn't per se um, necessary. Now, um, is your father the type of, I don't know him that well. I never really met him. Um, is he, um, there are different types of priests, right? And especially I think we're asked to do everything in the diaspora, whereas in Ethiopia, I think people have, more, um, I don't know, carved out lanes, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, like some people who just do the regular Eucharistic liturgy and baptisms, some people who only come for funerals, some people who only celebrate the non-Eucharistic liturgy, and some people who are just like researchers. You know, I almost would visualize myself as like a researcher more than like a regular uh servant of the eucharistic liturgy but personally if i was back home but here you know you do everything um is 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 his main thing like ministry to people uh, through the eucharistic liturgy and having like um uh, spiritual children that he visits or is it teaching and preaching or is it um singing so it's it's the latter the early two so it's mm -hmm. uh, uh Retaining spiritual children and also preaching and teaching. Mm -hmm. um, he, um, growing up in Ethiopia, we actually th there was a lot of um, you know issues, as I'm sure you can tell, um, in in uh, the homeland, just with the uh, parishes, because man, just various various reasons, and so uh, we we didn't really have um, regular eucharistic atten attendance necessarily um because there was no parish that you know if, if we were to go to one parish they'd be like oh why are you coming here every week all of a sudden like why you're not hired why are mm -hmm. you here? type of uh, mentality and my dad never needed to be hired as a priest because he, he his vocation was an it uh oh that's brilliant yeah yeah so brilliant he, he he never he was never uh, you know hired so every any time he would uh, show up at one church for more than once a week people would just look at him weird <laughs> which is weird so um in, instead of doing that you know through the blessing of um you know a blessed memory his grace uh he started a saturday and sunday uh, program for kids, uh, for youth, uh, and it's still going actually. Wow. I, I believe it's 11 years now. Uh, 11, 
Yes, 11, 12 years now. And so every every uh, weekend on Saturdays, there are programs for Amharic speaking. And then that's the one I attended like when I when I was back in Ethiopia. I never really went to liturgy as much. Uh, so that, there was that every week. And then on Sunday, ironically, I don't know if you have experience with this, uh, Hinoch, uh, there are a lot of kids in Ethiopia that don't know how to speak Amharic or just don't know how to speak any, any of the indigenous That's crazy. Languages. Yeah. The private school kids I have yes. met. I've yeah. never met someone who straight up doesn't know Amharic, but whose yeah, Amharic is at a kindergarten that. level or who are illiterate in the Fidel, who don't know the months of the year and stuff like that. I've met a lot of them that 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 don't and that like the parents are strictly I've met parents that just don't want their kids to know Amari. That's just so bizarre to me. It's so bizarre to me because yeah. they're in in Ethiopia. You know, like I would expect that here. Yeah. But then in Ethiopia, that was just so bizarre to me. So for that for those uh, uh, kids, there's a Sunday program which is fully in English. Wow. And so um the, the, I attended that a lot before I came here, and then we we moved here for the purposes, you know, the American dream, fulfilling the American dream, I believe. So uh, here we are. Beautiful. So were you were you then, and are you, because I I kind of see you in these two worlds, as I said. Were you drawn to that, where because a lot of your peers seem to be drawn to the the world of Aquaquam and Mahalit or the non-Eucharistic liturgy. And I see you drawn to it too, because you're obviously participating in it, but I also see you drawn to uh, teaching. Is this another false dichotomy? Can you be like a Bhagavad Gita and go for uh, the best of both worlds? Or um, are you are you focusing on one or the other? Is it is it like just different times in your life? I think uh, I'm approaching, I'm definitely approaching uh, the age in which I have to decide because, you know, um, the landscape here is not like that of Ethiopia in the, in the sense of you can't make uh, both your vocation and then have like an outside work because it would just be taking a lot of your time unless, you know, you took the time to actually learn it uh, with, with that welcome. And in which case, you know, it's just repetition, repetition throughout the year. But I haven't, you know, like like our brother Deacon Merit, I haven't um, achieved that level of uh, uh, scholasticism. So um, I am currently just trying to stick to the teaching and then um, the great feasts of the Lord uh, and the non-Eucharistic liturgy, liturgies. I, I participate in those. But then outside of that, I try to keep the a non eucharistic liturgies to a minimum so that I could focus on the most, the, the, the one vocation I believe has uh, the least amount of focus on, like among months most. So uh, I tend to stick towards that. And in that regard, um, I don't know, is there a way that you can encourage people your age to love? To learn what they don't all have to be teachers but to love to be taught in that way because i think it's an almost internal motivation that a lot of people have to participate in the smells and bells the wonder of our many liturgies but i don't see as many people on fire to learn is there any way you can share some of your fire inside of you that you have for learning? Like what, how could you get some of your peers to love to learn more? I think um, it's definitely very difficult because people who are my age, um, and I, I'm sure you can, you can tell because I, I tend to befriend people that are older, people that are my age are more, interested in um, the instant gratification of it all um, and it's very difficult to, to discuss that because you would just kind of be the odd man out um, and I don't, I don't even want to be the type of person that you know would try to make the case of why you should love it, uh, seeking knowledge seeking wisdom within the faith uh, making that case with the use of words but rather with the use of 
uh, experience. I guess that that's partly why I, I, I decided that I would have to stick to one vocation uh, within the uh, within the church and then one vocation out uh, as a you know professional because I want to be through God's grace the the embodiment of the embodiment of what people would assume the saints would be I guess like, to kind of say what uh, to to kind of follow what Devon Mahdi said once I I want to be a saint. I, yes. yeah, I want to be a saint. So like not, you know, to, to be like a Gudasi like, Kantu or just to glorify myself, but rather just emulate if anyone with any sense has read the saints, the fathers, the desert fathers, uh, they don't care about their glorification, but rather their attachment towards Christ. And through that mere association of them through Christ, anyone around them uh is you know called towards something higher if if they're willing to listen because i i definitely tried the route of trying to explain it intellectually but then it's very it's uh almost impossible it, unless there's that relational aspect if you're not related to mm -hmm. someone that's living that reality yes um and then having that peace it, it's it's impossible to because yeah it this the society has us by the chokehold I'm glad you said it aloud because I thought of it earlier. I thought of a Mahadi statement in what you had said about being a saint first. And yeah, he said that when he grows up, that's what he wants to be, as if he hasn't lived a full life already, the guy. <laughs> I'm going to get him on again uh, soon. He has a publication coming out. God, a million publications coming out. But um, <clears throat> are his publications like uh, sold in, in any uh, particular area? or? Uh, well, the ones with Princeton are. And he's going to have the philosopher Zerayak Op, uh, a new translation. He's been translated before, but they have a fresh translation of his works that is coming out in a tome earlier, uh, later this year in a non, uh, well, I guess it is uh, bought. I don't think we're going to make any money off it. But him and I have a, um, a piece of, um, what is it called? Uh, a piece of the diatessaron as it's found in ethiopic or in Ge'ez that we got from uh, a totally unique uh, sa'atat or orologium the liturgy of hours manuscript we found at saint catherine in um, in egypt in sinai saint catherine of sinai wow. in that uh very uh legendary place where moses would have received the ten commandments and spoken to god but um, also where a lot of, uh, it's kind of a crossroads of Armenian, Syriac, G is Greek, so many different uh, traditions, but the monastery is, it's interesting. It's under the, the Greek jurisdiction, but it's, it's in Egypt. Um, yeah, he has, he has more works. He's of course, um, finishing up his dissertation as well, which is going to be on, uh, Bagiorgis of Sagala or of Gasecha. So the, the man has a, a million works. That. Yeah. he has got a million works we got to get him on the program soon and he he might be one of those uh lights that are emanating onto you and i so that we go onto the world i always uh joke with people and make him uh make a black man blush when i tell people i'm his disciple uh but <laughs> <laughs> um while we're moving away from the subject can you do something that a lot of uh, people for and um, have done on the program can you pick either a misbak or an amala lesson chab chabbo to to sing for the audience if nothing else comes to mind i uh, was particularly touched as we're entering into the era of john when you were pointing out to me uh, one time uh, the song about making you all one as me and the father are one mm, yes um I actually um I would have to kind of look for the for the words um, for that one, but it, one that does come in mind because today is the Wazima for or the the eve of uh, New Year's. I was actually listening to it earlier. Um, there is um, from the non Eucharistic liturgy an um, and it, it goes as such: it says, "Wistahak ehuk natu adim nivratu." 
ገዳም ወነብረቱኒ ሰላም ነብረቱ ገዳም ወነገሩኒ ሰላም yes so it's referring to uh John the Baptist the forerunner saying everything within him like with ustahaqihu and not adim i'm not sure exactly what what that is i would i would have to look at the the context of it but i i, I would i would think it's referring to him being the forerunner and how he has good intentions and, and good zeal i guess if I, if i had to guess um and it goes as such ustahaqihu kanatu adim ustahaqihu kanatu adim na nabratu gadam wa nagaruni salam nabratu gadam wa nagaruni salam ah nabratu gadam wa nagaruni salam nabratu gadam Amen. May he have you hear the melodies of the angels. Amen. And um, as we are um, coming to a close too, I remember there was some John Chrysostom that you were reading recently. And I believe there was a question you were having about a, a particular text was it in in Matthew that perhaps you'd want to present and we can discuss uh which one um i believe it was about uh universalism there are the three parables in Matthew 25 and mm. if i'm remembering them correctly you have the 10 uh judges or young young women mm -hmm. uh, or virgins you have um uh you have the uh the maklit the um <laughs> i'm forgetting the english uh talents. whatever the talents thank yeah. you the talents and then you have the the sheep and the goats i believe it was about the parable of the the sheep and the goats which is also by the way in the anaphora of jacob of sarug that we have mm -hmm. i always like yeah, that so. yes uh, i i would definitely love to, to, to conversate about that because that was uh a head turner, especially after um, Father uh, Mabratu, uh, he sent that one book. I don't know if you if you recall uh, by this uh, Eastern Orthodox priest, which is uh, called Destined for Joy, um, and you know, in, in which he pretty much makes the case for universalism, and he wanted to use that as a topic of conversation uh, for the patristic brotherhood. I don't know if you recall that. And uh, yeah, I. I, I yeah i do i i i don't i think universalism is a heresy um but i and i think actually this text is the most damning against mm -hmm. universalism but why don't we uh, go to it we have um i have my bible out so i can follow along matthew 25 why don't you read for us 31 to the end make it like the tawahado bible study ah oh, very good okay matthew 25 31 i believe right Yes, 31 to the end. That's the third parable. Is it a parable speaking of, by the way? Because um, I was told from a certain uh, a sermon that that was the culmination of all the parables that he spoke and then just brought the, the actual events into, into vision. Um, but, okay, so here it is. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left then the king will say to those on the right hand come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was hungry and you gave me food I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you 
a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in pr prison, and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did not to do, to one of these least, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I mean, so what what was it that the universalist was saying <laughs> here that you thought would be a, a great topic? For, I really, uh, I wrote down one time, like a several of these verses because it just became clearer and clearer to me but to me this is the clearest passage against universalism so i'd love to hear what the universalist take on this passage is um i would have to say before i explain the the explanation i i from my understanding of what the person said it's the fact that it's not necessarily the fact that er, everyone will be saved and everyone will, will, will become come into fruition, but the sense that people don't necessarily have to be uh, have to enter the church through the sacraments through the great like the the grace giving sacraments, but rather all that they have to do is be quote unquote good people. So that's, oh, okay. That's, that's a the totally. Argument. That's the yes. argument. So, in, yes. in that sense, universalism in the, in the sense of people that are outside of the confines of the church, if yes. they want to do these things, they were they will they will be saved in that in that. Context. I know what you're saying. That's a totally different argument. Yeah, I I know that argument. Um, I don't know who to attribute it to, so I'm sorry. But I wrote a post actually back in 2016 about um, it hit me this exact point. Um, I had mercy done to me by an, an elderly Nepalese couple that couldn't speak any English when I was in North Dakota. I foolishly left my laundry detergent in my car. Um, it froze over, as you can imagine. It was six months of the year. It was like sub-zero in North Dakota. And by the time I wanted to wash clothes after school, I get to the place and was frustrated to find that my detergent was rock solid, you know, uh, probably something akin to the tool cane used to kill Abel. That's how hard it was. Uh, and a Nepalese guy sees me fidgeting with it, understands the situation, and offers me the detergent of his own to clean my clothes mm. so that I didn't have to be inconvenienced. And I kind of reflecting on that episode, I have no idea. I mean, he could have been a Christian convert, but more than likely he was not Christian. More than likely, he had a, something we'd call Baidam Lako, right? Probably some sort of polytheism from mm -hmm. Nepal. Um, and yet, God, in his judgment on Judgment Day, and this is my whole spiel against universalism, is that some people try to wring the hands of God to try to, out of his love, because they mess up the ontology and try to put like love and goodness as things independent of God that are above God, that God has to be beholden to, as opposed to things that emanate and come out of God. And they want to wring his hand because of those things that they think are like love and goodness are above God and mercy. And they, they try to tell him what it is. But but Judgment Day says, and our teaching, our dogma, the dogma of our church, Tinsai is a way, is that God, the resurrection of all, that God will decide who's in and who's out. And I don't know who to attribute it to, but there's the saying people say that uh, we're given a kind of blueprint or plan that there is salvation in the church, but it's easier to say where the Holy Spirit is active 
than where he is inactive, mm -hmm. where he is not. Mm -hmm. And and so the Holy Spirit could have been acting in that Nepalese man to give me that laundry detergent in that moment in North Dakota. And and there are you know a million or a multitude of other mercies that people outside of I mean who's our favorite person or at least my favorite person that I you know, talk about so much Fayat Awizayaman the the brigand or the criminal that was on the right side of the Lord uh, he's extra sacramental he's outside the sacraments mm -hmm. but he has the received the greatest sacrament which is the baptism of the blood the precious blood of our Savior. Mm. So I don't I don't think we will disagree then. Um, is there, um, yeah? Is there anything more to elaborate on in this passage about what you were what you were saying, or wh why certain people would maybe get stuck and think that it it refers only to, I don't know, super strictly our communion? I guess um, it, it would it would have to go to. Um... I'm not sure exactly why why people would uh, why anyone would uh, mis misinterpret that uh, and and try to use that as a scapegoat. I guess as you said to try to uh, compel God to His nature. I guess I, I I don't know if you've ever like heard these arguments uh, of atheists. Uh, you know of if God is all powerful, can He create a rock that He can't lift? Type of yes. uh, type of logic, and so. Um, in that sense, trying to compel God uh, with His own word, uh, and and that and that would fall short because of, and this is something I've I've, I've always wondered why people uh, tend to rely solely on certain verses slash passages, because verses were just the recent uh, addition to the scriptures. And um, like I would see a lot of people like, for example, Jeremiah 29, 11, um, for I have, you know, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper. And then, but then when you look at the context in which that verse it, that they're referencing in, it's a consolation that God is giving to the Israelites that are in captivity. And then, but then it has no barring uh, to, to, to you and your current state of, I mean, you can you can draw meaning out of it, but then it doesn't necessarily have any barring to your specific case of should I choose to be a lawyer or should I just choose to be you know like in, in those cases yes of uh, to, to to try to hinge that decision on that is uh, the ultimate uh, logicality in my the opinion. meme uh, in we could say the church meme that probably caused me the greatest belching laughter ever is somebody superimposing the text from that verse over the icon of St. Ignatius of Antioch being eating a, eaten alive by lions. Wow. Yeah, quite a, quite a, yeah. Huh. That's the plan God has for you, Nahum. Is to be eaten alive by lions. <laughs> May he make us worthy. <laughs> you know, I've been reading a, a little bit of his of his writings. It's just it's 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 so odd. Like, I've never I've never I don't think I'll ever meet someone who really really wanted to die, uh, and and in in, in in such a way, you know, uh, who really wanted to die um, in, in such a way, which is you know so bizarre to me because uh, we have to pretty much beg the youth. To listen to us with all these, you know, uh, tactics with the with the sermonizing and then uh, adding um, popular culture references and then like a little bit of mazmur and then a little bit of uh, you know the instruments and everything to get people to want to come to the faith. But then there are people like Ignatius that just want to jump into the den of a lion uh, just to meet to be with Christ. Uh, that yeah, that that will never. Uh, make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> May it make sense to us? Yes, there was a these Berrigan brothers, this anti-nuclear warhead um, activists in the United States. They were Catholic priests, and um, they have a turn of phrase that I use often, which is, uh, "If you want to follow Jesus, you better look good on wood." <laughs> <laughs> Similar, you know, if your master is crucified, don't expect less. Exactly. Um, do you have any? Um, 
parting thoughts as we as we head out um we didn't get to plug the lazarus so please plug lazarus as well uh yes um i i am uh if there's one thing i guess uh, with the with the service that i'm giving um through lazarus and then you know other avenues uh here as well i the world we live in is uh at the, at the expense of sounding cliche the world we live in is 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 a very complicated and uh confusing landscape and the only way out out of it uh both in the present and in, in the afterlife is to behold the only one that actually overcame the world in its fullest sense and um i hope that i hope and pray that no one is caused to fall because of me but then also i hope through his grace that anyone that i come into uh counter with uh is edified and may that be the will of god that's that's what i have to say amen and where can people find your ministry if they want to hear more from you yes um so i am currently using um youtube and instagram um on instagram the handle is at lazarus EOTC, and on youtube is it's the same title lazarus uh, space uh, all caps uh, eotc um definitely going, going to be pushing uh, out uh, some content not too much in the sense of to bombard people but actually uh sound contents such as our brother uh that would help um that those are the avenues in which to find it thank you so much for being on the program thank you for having me